welcome back to the Sennheiser Plus Paste Interactive Studio and Lounge at South by Southwest 2013. I'm film editor Michael Dunaway, paste film editor Michael Dunaway, and I am here with Carlton Cukes, who is the co-creator of Lost, former head writer on Lost, and now has a new uh, series coming out that he has previewed for us here at South by Southwest called Bates Motel. So thank you for joining us. Uh, very happy to be here. Did I get all that right? I'm getting no, a little. No, I mean I am a co-showrunner. Uh, Damon Lindelof and I were the the, the two guys who ran the show uh, for its six-year run, um, and we were jointly the head writers of the show. So, gotcha. let's give Damon. There. Let's get let's yeah. let's give him his due, right? That's right. So, <laughs> okay. But yeah, we, that was you know that was yeah that was sort of my monastic existence for six years of my life was right. basically uh, working on that show for. 121 hours of uh, <laughs> programming, but I'm really excited. You know, I, I after Lost was over, I was really, you know, fried and burned out, and took up some time off, and yep. you know, kind of contemplated what I was going to do next. And you know, Bates Motel might not seem like the most logical <laughs> next step, but it was it was kind of exactly the right thing. It was it was a story that I think allowed for some of the twists and turns and surprises yep. of Lost, but in a very very different context. It's a much more it's a smaller sca scope story, and um, it really is focused on this incredibly interesting and complex relationship between Norma and Norman Bates. Mm -hmm. And um, my co-writer on Bates Motel, Carrie Aaron, and I were really fascinated by kind of trying to reimagine what the relationship between Norman Bates and Norma Bates would be like. You know, that movie is so intriguing because Norma Bates doesn't exist in the movie. She right. exists as this, as a corpse and in some sort of fiction in Norman's brain. And Spoiler alert. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I thought, you know, what if, what if we were to sort of re-examine that relationship and see, and kind of, kind of felt like, what if we put our own spin on it? So what we're doing in, in Bates Motel is not a, you know, we're not retelling the same story. We're not slavishly locked into the mythology of the original movie. We just sort of took these characters and some of the iconography of the original and are telling a whole brand new story. It, you actually just called out one of the words that I wanted to ask you about is, is how great was it to be able to have this existing mythology that you didn't have to feel shackled to and yet there are these moments of uh, great resonance even just in the pilot yeah. that if you're telling a completely new story that we didn't know what happened later would be meaningless until later but now with us knowing what comes later there are little moments in the pilot that you go Oh, that shock of recognition, you know? Yeah, I mean, there are a few little um, Hitchcockian shout outs, but yeah. basically the idea was original. But having these characters was really great because really it's kind of a tragedy, and a tragedy is a great storytelling form. But if you go into a network and you say, hey, <laughs> I've got a great tragedy for you, it's about this 17 year old kid and his 40 year old mother, and they're in an incredibly intense, nearly romantic relationship, <laughs> almost sexual, not sexual, and she eventually ends up dead and stuffed <laughs> like you're not going to sell that show <laughs> but when you actually when it's Norma and Norman Bates when you can sort of put it within the moniker of Psycho that's a really interesting story yeah. and the what's what was really important to Carrie Aaron and I was trying to basically say what if we what if we really like these characters what if we really love Norman Bates and his mother and we're really invested in their relationship and then we start wondering like are they going to meet their inevitable fate? You know, we, we start feeling really uncomfortable about that. It's like in Titanic, you know, you fall in love with Kate and Leo and you're like, you hope that what is going to happen to them doesn't, but inevitably it's going to happen. And yeah. I think that that's, that's the essence of all good tragedy is becoming attached to the characters in the story. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you mentioned another thing I wanted to ask you about, which was that, that chemistry and that relationship. Uh, it's so deftly handled in the pilot in that as I watched it, I kind of squirmed a little bit, but I never went to completely grossed out by it, which right. I thought was, I, it seemed like exactly what you were going for. Uh, Vera, I'm such a fan of Vera. She's such a brilliant actor. Tell me about uh, finding, that, finding that right balance for that relationship between the two of them. I mean, that's a great question. I mean, we wanted... We wanted them to have, like, they were the most important relationship in each other's lives. So, like, but, you know, you, your relationship with your mom is, shouldn't really be the central relationship in your life <laughs> beyond a certain point. Um, but for them, that, you know, for Norma, 
she would love to just have Norman be the most important person for the rest of his life and, yeah. and vice versa. But, and so the beginning of the pilot is almost there's this timeless quality, and we were just discussing this before the interview, that yeah. when you watch the beginning of the show, you're not really sure if it's period or if it's contemporary. And that was very intentional because we wa I wanted to, the, to feel like they were out of time. Like yeah. we, we, we tried to make it feel like their relationship had this quality of like bantering couples in a 40s or 50s movie. Yeah. But that collides with the real world and, and the results are not good. I mean, that's not the best kind of relationship to have. And so that collision of this insular relationship with the world is one of the big points of drama in the series. Yeah. Um, Vera, you know, was phenomenal. Like when I write, I always like imagine somebody's actor, some actor in my brain. And so for me, I always thought about Vera Farmiga and right from the get go, she was my prototype. And after we wrote three scripts, um, Carrie Aaron and I said, well, let's just send them to Vera. Like, what, what's the worst she's going to do? Say no. And she loved them and said, I'm really interested. And it was incredible because, like, I, you know, to, to get an Academy Award nominated actress like Vera Farmiga to do a cable series, not a high probability event, yeah. but she really, she really kind of understood what we were going for and I think saw the potential for this character. And I think, especially by the time you get to the later episodes of the season, she is just utterly captivating. I wow. mean, she, if she doesn't uh, get nominated for a Golden Globe or an Emmy, I'll you know, eat my hat. <laughs> well, just based on the little I've seen, I would second that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. She, she's amazing. Um, let's talk about the first sequence, uh, and I don't want to give too much away for people that are going to be watching it, but um, uh, as I told you, uh, one of the things that really struck me about it is the rhythm of it, even the way it was lit, what happens, it felt very much like, I'm an old comics geek, right? Yeah. It felt very much like a superhero origin story, and that was thrilling to me, because it not like because I'm a comic book geek and I want to see comic books and movies, but because it sets the tone of great import. This is going to be a big story. This is not yeah. playing small. Yeah. W uh, was that a deliberate sort of throwing down the gauntlet from the beginning? It was. I mean, I think right from the get-go, we wanted to challenge the audience. Um, we wanted to challenge the audience's assumption about what the mythology was between Norm and Norman Bates. Like, if you watch Psycho and, and, and someone were to say, well, what happened? How did Norman Bates become Norman Bates? You would probably say, well, he had this crazy mother who was shrill and demeaning and, you know, drove him insane until he became a serial killer. Yeah. So we basically created our own mythology that, that puts a different spin on it. And that thing that you saw at the beginning continues. And we actually, you know, in a few episodes, you're going to learn much more about what exactly that you didn't see the whole story in that first scene. And yeah. so that that's a that's a, a really interesting turn that comes um, a few episodes into the series and really gives you a different spin on the whole relationship between Norma and Norman Bates. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, you know, I can't let you go without asking a couple of Lost questions. Uh, so I've, I've only got two for you. I won't, I won't okay. make the whole interview be about Lost. But, uh, you know, our mutual friend Michael Emerson is yeah. uh, so brilliant in the, in, the, uh, in the series as Ben. And uh, from what I understand, uh, the, the, the part originally was not quite as big as it a actually ended up being. Can you kind of tell how much of that is true or is that part of Lost legend? No, that's actually completely true. So... Um, Damon and I had this story idea, which was that we would capture an other and hold him as like a prisoner of war in, in the hatch, and that when he was let go, we would discover after the fact that he was the leader of the others. And we thought, well, this was a cool story idea. And if it, you know, and we thought, well, if it works, we'll make this guy the leader of the others. If it doesn't work, we don't even have to actually execute that. We just say it was another that was captured. And so then we started thinking about actors. And we did a lot of reverse engineering on Lost, where we basically, we'd come up with an, sort of a rough idea for a part, then think of an actor, and then sort of tailor it like a suit for that actor. And so we had both seen Michael Emerson in The Practice, where he played this crazy you know, serial killer. And he was just so gripping, and it was just fixated in our brains. And so we said, well, let's get Michael Emerson. And so he came on to do three episodes. And that was when he, saw, um, he did the famous, you know, uh, got any milk line. And it was sort of at that point, it was like, oh, this guy's too good. And as a, as a writer in television, it's a very organic, interactive process. As, as, as you watch a cut, you start 
getting activated by what actors do. And so Michael Emerson was so intriguing that we just wanted to write more and more. So instead of three episodes, he did eight episodes that season. And instead of sort of vanishing from the show, he became the sort of main, pro the main antagonist. Sure. And um, it was hard to imagine lost without him. Yeah. And that was something, that was part of the spontaneous evolution that occurred during the show. Yeah. I mean, eventually we, d we knew the others were antagonists in the show, but he became the face of them in a way that we never could have imagined before we actually cast him. Yeah. Uh, by the way, one of my favorite moments ever in any television show, uh, and it's probably not one that people come up and talk to you about, but... Uh, you know, we'd heard so much about the others. It was so mysterious. We were already all so gripped. And the episode where uh, Jin comes running out of the jungle and his, and his, and his, his handcuffs, and, and he says, Udders, Udders. Yeah. I had the biggest chill when that happened because I was like, holy crap, we're about to find out who the others are, you know? It was yeah. a really great moment. It's so well handled. Uh, congratulations on that. Oh, well, thank, <laughs> thanks, thanks. Um, and my second question for you is, uh, gosh, I know you're sick to death of talking about the ending, but I have a little theory about about uh, people's reactions to the ending. Yeah, I loved the final episode. I loved it. I have plenty of friends who hated it. <laughs> I'm sure you've heard from both. Sure. There seems to be a divide among my friends. All the ones who hate it are have what I would call a modernist enlightenment mindset. I'm not saying that's good or bad, but they seem to be all modernists. And all the people that love it seem to have sort of a postmodern mindset. Uh, does that at all jive with sort of how y'all thought about the ending? Or, or just tell me about your, what, sort of your process of getting to the point of saying, you know what, we know this is going to be controversial, but we're going to end it this way. Well, I mean, there was, there was no way that the ending was not going to be controversial. Right. I mean, and there was also no way we could answer all of the unanswered questions. And by the way, just sort of doing an ending that answered all of the unanswered question would have been didactic it would have been boring and we did an episode called across the sea which was the origin story of sort of jacob, jacob and the man in black and that was sort of as close to i think a mythological ending as as we could come and i think a lot of people had mixed the feelings about that yeah. and we always sort of considered like questions on loss like the we, we call this sort of the big bang theory which is like if you start asking questions they always beget other questions okay. so if you say well how did the universe start what was with the big bang well what was before that and so we felt like there was just no way to satisfactory satisfactorily answer those things and i think also philosophically i think we felt like you know life doesn't give us all answers you know there's a lot of mystery in life and yeah. You know, we, we felt that the important resolution to the show was like, what happens to these characters? What is, the show was really called Lost, not because they were lost on Desert Island, but because they were lost in their lives and they were all sort of seeking redemption. And we tried to, we made an ending that was sort of about their spiritual closure. And for Damon and, and I, that felt like the exact right ending. And we stand by it. I mean, we, just, we had lunch um, last week and we were just, we were talking about it. I mean, there's no lack of, there's no regrets. I mean, I think neither of us is sitting here going, oh, we, we wish we'd done this or that. Um, and, you know, I get, I, I get a lot more positive comments on my Twitter feed than negative ones. Yeah. Uh, you know, Damon has fun, like, interacting with the people who write negatively and maybe it creates a sense that there's, <laughs> you know, a lot of negativity out there. But I think there are also, there are plenty of people who are, um, just really, you know, positive about it. And I, I think that it was inevitable. It was just that that was just what was going to happen. And, you know, we, but we, we told our version of the story. And um, I think that's all you can do as a storyteller. I, I agree. And I think watching that last episode is actually a life lesson. The act of watching it is actually a life lesson. Because what I always tell people about it is, the point is not to get all the right answers. The point is to go on the journey and to go on the journey together as human beings. And it's such, that last episode to me is so much about the relationships. You know, yeah. not only the individual journeys, but the relationships, how right. we, in Bono's words, we get to carry each other. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, exactly. I think, you know, the, the slight paraphrasing, you know, my version of that is we lift each other up. That's kind of the most important thing we might do on this in this journey of our lives. Yeah. And that was something that was sort of spiritually important to, to both Damon and myself. And, yeah. you know, so, and you, you yeah. said it very well. I, I should, you know, kind of, I need, I need to get the, I'll have to go back on the internet and write that down <laughs> yeah. so I have it for future reference. You can pretend you said it. I, <laughs> okay. I, 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 I'll give you that one. <laughs> that is all with Carlton Cuse, 
from the Pace Plus Sennheiser Interactive Studio and Lounge. Thanks for joining us. We'll be here for another day and a half. I don't know how we're going to top Carlton Cuse, but we're going to try. Uh, so please keep, uh, keep tuning in. I'm Michael Dunaway, film editor of Paste.